Hi, I'm Jeff, and today I'm gonna to show you how you can create some advanced effects in Blackout. I know this is a long anticipated video, and it's because we have a lot going on in this effects engine, and there's a lot that we're also changing and new features that we're building. So keep that in mind while we're going through this that some things may change. But in general, you should be able to create virtually any effect you can think of with the right tweaks. I'll show you some common effects you can do using this Titan tube behind me. But in general, Bluetooth is not your friend. In fact, we don't even allow effects over Bluetooth because it's such a slow protocol compared to Artnet or SACN. So you have to be wired or wireless when using effects in Blackout. If you want your effects to be really solid, you should really be hardwired from the iPad to your network for best performance. Also, I know a lot of you love the ultimate modes for controlling fixtures and they're great because it's like operating a light from the back of the head where you can switch to different modes and not have to think about what you're doing with the profile. But in general, they're not good for effects unless you really know what you're doing and have an intimate knowledge of that profile to understand how it's going to be modified by an effect. So choose as simple of a profile as you can get away with. If you put this light in just the dim plus RGB mode, because you know you're gonna be able to do just generic color chase effects on set, that's an awesome profile to go with because it's only 64 addresses per tube. So you can fit eight tubes on one universe versus a more film friendly profile that has color temperature and tint and a crossfade channel like mode 111, which has 112 addresses per tube. So you can only fit four tubes on a universe. So it's just something to think about when you're on set and running data to all of these lights is how are you going to use them in your effects? Let's get started. This Titan tube is connected to the Rat Pack via CRMX and my iPad is connected to the Rat Pack's Wi-Fi. I'm also gonna show you how you can use Capture, the visualizer, to show what is going on. If you don't have lights, you can test with, but for now, let's start patching this Astera in Blackout. So from a new project, I'm going to go to the Patch tab and click Unpatch to start with a clean slate. I will tap Add Fixtures, and because I have nothing patched in my show, nothing is in my show fixtures. So I will go to Add from Fixture Database, which goes to our cloud database. If you haven't, get on the internet, update by syncing the database, and you'll have the latest profiles. I'm going to navigate to Astera, Titan Tube. We're gonna go into the multi-cell profile, and I will show you that dim RGB is only 64 addresses compared to what we're gonna go into right now, the more film-friendly version, just so I can show you guys this, which is mode 111, and that is 112 addresses. So we're gonna go ahead and patch this, which is what that tube is set to right now. And I'm gonna go ahead and just save this. Go back to channel view. And now here is our 16 pixel Astera tube. So we'll just go ahead and test this. So if I just turn this to full, boom, turns on. I'm gonna go to fixture controls, change the color temperature. Cool, that works. Let's go ahead and crossfade this to like red, great, blue, awesome. So cool, that works. Now, for those of you who don't have lights at home that you can test with, you can get a visualizer such as Capture, which allows you to kind of visualize and see what your fixtures would do without actually physically having them. It's meant for more live and theater-based applications where you have a bunch of lights and you wanna see the general look that they will give throughout a show or throughout your program, but it can work in a limited capacity in our situation. So if you have Capture, go to a new project and you're gonna to go to the library tab and I'm just gonna get us started and recreate this scene. So I'm gonna to go to forms. I'm just gonna create a little platform for everything to stand on by dragging the box form here. If I press enter, I'm going to get the details pane. I'm gonna put a width right here of 20 feet, a depth of 20 feet and a height of three inches. As you can see, this is the top view, this is a front view and this is a right view. And I can just kind of scroll in to get a little bit closer here in each of these panes. I'm gonna go back into library. I'm going to look for a people. I'm gonna get my actor, put him here. And if I press enter, I'm going to pose him. So I'm gonna put his legs straight, but I'm gonna have him holding a stair tube. So I'm gonna put his arms forward. And now he's kind of in a position to do that. So again, I'll zoom in. I'm gonna go back to library. I'm going to go to fixtures. I'm going to search. Titan tube, 
and I will go ahead and drag this kind of where his hand is. And as you can see, it's down here in the right view. So I'm just going to click and drag this up to where his hand is, let go, and now it is pretty much in his hand. If you hold the middle mouse button and drag, you can get into 3D view, and now you can really see that it's in his hand. And if you hold shift and the middle mouse button, you can move horizontally and vertically like so. Now we need to see which way this is facing. So we are going to tap these three buttons here, click live, and we need to turn the light on. So we will go here to the power button, turn the light on. And I don't know if you saw that, but it's a very little bit right here. It's because it's facing down. So if we middle mouse button and drag around, you can see, oh, it's facing down. And if we turn the ambient light up, you can really see this easily. So we need to turn this. So we're gonna go back into wireframe, control W, and then control three to get us lined up in our right view. And now we'll grab the fixture. Now, sometimes it's hard to grab through something. So you can actually like select marquee select in another frame up here and you will have him down here. Now again, shift middle mouse button to kind of realign. Now, if I grab this handle and I hold shift, I can lock it into different increments and I can go to 90 degrees. Now, when I middle mouse button and move around, and go control R to get into live view. Now you can see this is kind of like more or less in the right direction. Okay, but now we need to get capture talking with blackout so that the fixture can respond appropriately to all of the commands and signals that we are sending it. That's very easy to do because blackout is sending SACN and ArtNet to a network. So all that you need to do is get your computer on the same network that blackout is in and Blackout is currently on the Rat Pack AKS Wi-Fi. So I'm just simply going to connect my laptop to the Rat Pack AKS Wi-Fi, and we will be able to see the data coming in. So if I go into my Wi-Fi tab, and I select my Rat Pack AKS network, now I can go into my Universes tab and Capture, and I can see this SACN Universe data coming in on Universe 1. If I tap that, I can get a preview of what's in the universe. And you can see all the different levels that we have set right here. Now, here's a fun little fact. If you go to edit, you can actually drag these to have a different number of rows. And this can help you in diagnosing problems with DMX. So if I go right here, I know each cell is seven channels long. And if I drag this down, you can see that all of these cells are responding the same way. So if you ever make like a multi-cell profile that seems a little bit weird, this is a great way to diagnose that. Okay. So now that we have data coming in, we need to make sure that this tube is patched correctly so it is responding the same way. So again, we will select the tube and we can patch this simply by dragging this into our universe right here. Now, obviously this is just RGB, so it's the incorrect profile. So I'm gonna go here to the properties. I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to change the mode to mode 111, which is what we have patched in blackout and on the two. Now that we are there, you can see this is the same color as what is going on in the real world. Now I kind of want to orient them so that they are perfectly lined up, so vertically. So what I'm going to do is actually turn this fixture off. I'm just gonna select cell one, turn this on. And now you can see cell one is actually up here. So I want that to happen in capture. So we're gonna to go to capture, we're gonna select the tube. And if I use this red handle in this front view, we can actually kind of align this appropriately. And now if I expand this and move around, maybe zoom out just slightly, this is my little capture scene, recreating this scene that we have here. We're off to a great start. Now, one of those caveats that I mentioned about using a visualizer is sometimes they get things wrong in profiles. For example, if I turn this whole tube back on and I mess with the crossfade, you're gonna see a nice gradual crossfade from this blue color to 3200. But in capture, it's going to jump. So watch, if I bring this crossfade down, in the real world, it's gradually transitioning. And in capture, you're gonna see, boom, right there, it jumps. So for whatever reason, incorrect implementation, 
some things like that you have to be aware of. Also, Capture cannot handle any ultimate modes because it's too much for it to handle where you have a conditional channel nested within another conditional channel nested within another conditional channel. We're one of the only consoles that can do that. To ask for visualizers to do that is an exponentially bigger request for them to visualize what is going on. It's a lot to keep them track of. So another reason why to keep your profiles simple. If I now go ahead and reset this light, the first thing that I like to do when creating effects is create multiple selections so that I can change an effect pretty rapidly just by changing the selection. Let me give you an example. If I go ahead and select channel one, press dot dot cells only, and I record this into group one, and I'm gonna call this straight as if this is a straight selection. And now I'm gonna press offset and I'm going to do inside out. And if you see, if I press offset again, you can see how that is listed here. Click back, tap record. I'm gonna put this into group two and I'm gonna say this is inside out. Now, if I double tap one, you can go in the order of the selection as groups remember selection order. So if I press next now, I can next my way through this selection. You can see how an effect would handle this group. Now, if I tap inside out twice, I'm going to see this order is different. And as you can see, this would be an entirely different effect, even if we had the same parameters running across it. So let's start by creating a default effect and seeing what is causing it to act that way. So if I go into groups, I tap straight and I record this into my first effect, press save, and now I just play this effect. You can see I get a nice chase going across the whole tube. This is across every pixel in the tube because again, my selection is the pixels of the tube. Let's go ahead and stop this and look why that is happening. So we have two steps. It's going to take one second to ramp up to get to 100%. It's going to dwell there for a second, and then it's going to take one second to transition down to the background value and hold there for one second. Now, the background value is basically what the light is previously at in regards to what has priority of it. So the channel view is where you are interacting with most of your fixtures and you can put them in looks and you can put them in other effects. So whatever has previous priority of that fixture before it goes into the effect is what that background value is at. It's going for an infinite duration. Its grouping is set to spread. So it is spreading across the entire selection and it's not grouping them in any different way. And the trail is set to even. Trail is simply the time between steps. And as you shrink the trail, your effects will get longer and smoother because the steps will be stacked closer together. And if you increase the trail, your chases will get shorter and a little bit choppier. An even trail means that it is evenly distributing the steps across your entire selection. So it should give you a great starting place for an effect. This is going forward. You can reverse the effect just by tapping this button. You can bounce the effect so it goes from one end to the other and back. You can select random groups so it's going to randomize the selection and the grouping of this effect. And then the random rate is attached to these two faders right here. Random rate simply affects the total time. So if you want your total time to always be four seconds or faster, I would put the low to 100% and the high to whatever you want. So say it's like 200% right here. This would always go from four seconds to two seconds or somewhere in between. Again, it's going to be a randomized rate when you have this selected between these two sliders. Why does it go to 470? I don't know. I told my programmer 500% and this is what happens. So the easiest way to see this effect in action is by going trail solo so that each step is soloed before the next light starts. Again, these are pixels. There's 16 pixels. We can think of them as 16 different fixtures and each cell is going to wait until the last cell completed both of these steps. So watch, if I press play, the first one's gonna go up in a second, dwell there for a second, go down in a second, hold there for a second before the next one starts. Okay, so up in one second, hold there for a second, down in one second, hold there for a second, next one. 
That is how trail works. So now let's see, and solo would be 100%. If you did percentage to 100%, it would be the same thing. 50% would be the second cell starts right after the first cell finishes step one. Okay, so if we did this to 50%, and the effects engine, sometimes you need to stop it and restart it for it to uh, take effect. So you can see now we are kind of expanding this chase length and smoothness just by putting the percentage down. So now let's go to the extreme and let's do something like 10%, right? So if I press play, hey, now we're starting to get a smoother chase, right? What happens if we did like 1%? That's a really nice smooth chase and it's also very long because again, each one of these pixels is starting at 1% of the way through that first step. The next one starts, then 1% way through that one, the next one starts. So that's why all of them look like they're almost coming on at the same time is because they're following one right after each other really quickly and that creates your long smooth chase. So just by changing the percentage of the trail, you're able to get a longer and smoother chase.